Many who are selectively indignant about the immorality of slavery in American society or in Western civilization do not merely pass over in silence the larger-scale slavery in other parts of the world, but sometimes even attempt to apologize for the latter. The argument often used by apologists for slavery in the antebellum American South, that slaves were treated like members of the family, has often been uncritically accepted for African or Middle Eastern societies, though dismissed out of hand for slavery in the United States. Some of the forms of involuntary servitude in non-Western societies have even been said to not have been really slavery, though scholars have differed among themselves on the definition of a slave. The treatment of slaves has varied enormously, usually according to the kinds of work that slaves did. Around the world, plantation slaves have been almost universally treated worse than slaves used as domestic servants, for example. Given that plantation slavery was more common in the Western Hemisphere than in the Ottoman Empire, where slaves were more likely to be domestic servants, an argument could be made that the treatment of slaves in some societies was in general worse than in others. However, the high mortality rates and low reproduction rates of slaves in the Islamic countries should caution against accepting self-serving arguments that slaves were treated like members of the family in that part of the world, any more than in the American South. The absence of a critical literature or an anti-slavery movement outside the West left the abuses of slaves in non-Western countries without the kind of exposure or denunciation that such abuses provoked in European and European offshoot societies. Even so, terrible mortality rates were known to exist among slaves in Egyptian salt mines or among slaves in Iraq. For all the domestic slavery of Africa, there were also slave plantations in East Africa and on the island of Zanzibar. Europeans enslaved by North Africans were often used as galley slaves, which could be killing work. But slaves or former slaves in non-Western countries did not have an audience for stories of their oppressions comparable to that of slaves or former slaves in the United States, where the experiences of Frederick Douglass and other former slaves were widely publicized outside the South. The lone exception would be the narratives of European slaves in North Africa after they were ransomed or escaped back to Europe, or the stories told by the smaller number of Americans who were enslaved in North Africa and then rescued by the U.S. Navy in the early 19th century. But the audiences for their stories were in the West, not in the Islamic countries where they had been enslaved. Moreover, the stories of white slaves in the Islamic world were of interest only in the West of their time, not in the West of our time, when such experiences are largely passed over in silence, like other historical facts that do not fit today's visions and agendas. Direct observation of the treatment of slaves was less common with domestic slaves living behind walls or galley slaves hidden in the bowels of ships, as distinguished from plantation slaves working out in open fields. However, what was directly observable in the Islamic world were the slave caravans which marched vast numbers of human beings from their homes where they had been captured to the places where they would be sold, hundreds of miles away, often after spending months crossing the burning sands of the Sahara. The death toll on these marches exceeded even the horrific toll on packed slave ships crossing the Atlantic. Slaves who could not keep up with the caravans were abandoned in the desert and left to die a lingering death from heat, thirst, and hunger. Thousands of human skeletons were strewn along one Saharan slave route alone, mostly the skeletons of young women and girls who were more in demand than men in much of the Islamic world. These skeletons tended to cluster in the vicinity of wells, suggesting their last desperate efforts to reach water. A letter from an Ottoman official in 1849 referred to 1,600 black slaves dying of thirst on their way to Libya. It has been estimated that, for every slave to reach Cairo alive, several died on the way. Whether or not the survivors were later treated better or worse than slaves in the Western Hemisphere after reaching their final destinations is by no means the whole story. While much of the history of the treatment of slaves has been presented as a history of the treatment of African slaves, the treatment of European slaves in North Africa and elsewhere was by no means benign. For example, this was the scene in 18th century Algiers as newly captured European slaves were paraded through town. Since the arrival of new slaves was a sign of prosperity and an occasion of civic pride for all the townsfolk, the resident Turks, Moors, Jews, and renegades all turned out to cheer and taunt the newcomers. Local children especially followed the slaves as they shuffled along, loudly humiliating them and sometimes threw refuse at them.
The newly captured men's heads and beards were roughly shaved bare as part of the demoralization process to break their spirit, and slaves of either sex could be stripped naked for sale at auction. Most of the female slaves were used for domestic work, but the men tended to be used for work requiring strength, including the brutal and degrading work of galley slaves. When the ship was idle, slaves who needed to relieve themselves could make their way to the opening at the hull side of their bench, known as the borda, dragging their part of the chain and presumably climbing over their sleeping companions. The only liberty that is given us in the galley, recalled Louis Marat, is to go to this place when we have occasion. This, however, many slaves were apparently too exhausted or dispirited to do and often ended up simply fouling themselves where they sat. The resulting stench, as many observers agreed, was beyond belief. But besides the fumes in which they labored, the shackled geati were also tormented by rats, fleas, bedbugs, and other parasites. In the middle of the 16th century, galleys propelled by the rowing of slaves were common in the Mediterranean, among both Europeans and their Islamic neighbors and enemies. In their epic naval battle of Lepanto in 1571, an estimated 80,000 rowers propelled the galleys of the warring powers, and these rowers were mostly slaves. The need for galley slaves later declined as Europeans first began to rely on sails for power, so that by the late 1600s, galley slaves were found primarily in vessels from North Africa and the Middle East. Later, as sails became more common on Mediterranean vessels from the Islamic countries as well, the hideous work of galley slaves also declined. While North African pirates enslaved Europeans primarily from the countries around the Mediterranean, they occasionally ranged much farther afield. Some of these pirates sailed into the English Channel and even into the Thames estuary. A 17th century British parliamentary report said, The fishermen are afraid to put to sea, and we are forced to keep continual watch on all our coasts. Nevertheless, Algerians were estimated to have captured more than 350 British ships between 1672 and 1682, which would mean that they enslaved a few hundred Britons annually. Earlier, in 1627, these pirates ranged even farther afield and raided Iceland, carrying off nearly 400 people into bondage. As late as the early 19th century, Barbary pirates captured American ships on the high seas and enslaved their crews. The phrase, to the shores of Tripoli, is in the U.S. Marine Corps hymn because Marines were part of a naval expedition sent to rescue hundreds of Americans from bondage in North Africa and serve as a warning against further pirate attacks on American ships. Not all the captured Europeans became slaves. Some were ransomed, as were Americans. After a successful raid on a European coast, the pirates sometimes sailed out of sight and then returned a day or two later under a white flag to offer to sell some of their captives back to their families. This was especially effective when the captives were children or youths who might be brought before their parents in the custody of a fearsome and leering moor to leave no doubt what awaited them in slavery perhaps even before they arrived in Barbary. The story of how human beings treat other human beings when they have unbridled power over them is seldom a pretty story, or even a decent story, regardless of the color of the people involved. When the roles were reversed, Africans did not treat Europeans any better than Europeans treated Africans. Neither can be exempted from moral condemnation applied to the other.